Good day, Adam's children, and welcome to this week's sermon, whose message comes from on high. Cars are found all over the wasteland. The pre-war world was in love and highly dependent on these boats with wheels. In the post-war, they are piled up to make walls, are salvaged for parts, provide some seriously impressive light shows, and are the apex predator of the Commonwealth. Let's look at the cars of Fallout find their real-world design inspirations, and go over any interesting lore related to them in the process. Crank up the rads, and let's get this road trip started. Let's start this off strong with an absolute legend, the Chrysalis Highwayman. The Highwayman holds the distinction of being the first player-drivable car in the entire series, being introduced to the world in Fallout 2. The Highwayman may not look like much now, when the Chosen One first encounters it in Smitty's junkyard in the west side of the den, but back in the day, it was something to behold. According to a mechanic in Fallout 2, it shares its impressive specs with another Chrysler's car, a Corvega Coupe. Before the Great War, it was advertised as having over 800 horsepower, a 0-60 time of less than a second, and apparently used no computers opting instead for a fully analog control system. Dialogue in Fallout 2 explicitly states that it is an electric vehicle and it is fed by fuel cells or batteries. And in the case of Fallout 2, it can be fueled by microfusion cells or small energy cells. This is all kind of moot, however, since when the Chosen One first encounters the Highwaymen, it is not in functioning condition. The Chosen One is told that they can buy it for 2,000 NCR dollars but only after getting a new fuel cell controller, which can only be found in one place. All things considered, the car is not in terrible condition, and between the in-game sprite and the picture that we can see when traveling in the overworld, we can get a good idea for what real-world designs it takes after. The body and the large tail fins are reminiscent of the 1957 Chevrolet Bel Air, but the lights are not the same. The light and grille shape are close to the 57 to 59 Plymouth Belvedere, although in this instance the bumper is different. This design inspiration is confirmed by Matt Norton, one of the lead designers for Fallout 2, where he said they intended to have a car with a bulky power source bolted to the back of a 57 Chevy. There is a sprite that shows this with large tanks in the back, but this sprite did not make it into the game. Furthermore, a press pack handed out at the 1998 ECTS described the Highwaymen as a modified 1950s-style eight-cylinder Chevy. The Highwaymen can be upgraded to perform a lot better, though. A fuel cell regulator can be scavenged off another immobile Highwaymen in Trapper Town, which increases fuel efficiency by 50%. Another 45% increase can be had if an NPC from the chop shop in New Reno, known as T-Ray, tunes the car and installs an upgrade called Grav Plates but this can only happen after the destruction of the Enclave oil rig. This mysterious grav plate technology apparently allows the Highwaymen to levitate a bit above the ground, although there is no in-game change to the look of the car. This with the other upgrades allow for a near 100% increase in fuel efficiency, in addition to the awesome perks that the Highwaymen already offers. The Highwaymen makes traveling in the overworld much quicker, and this too can be upgraded using all the available upgrades, which includes T-Ray's adjustments, a blower, which can be bought for $1,000 from a hobo named Ratchet, and the grav plates will increase speed by an astonishing 800% over walking. And honestly, I can see why grav plates help a lot, since the Chosen One doesn't seem to travel over any roads, and the Highwayman doesn't look like it has much in the way of suspension, so being able to hover in some way would be very useful in rough terrain. The trunk can be used to expand the player's inventory, and somehow grav plates can max out this trunk capacity. It is interesting to note that unlike personal inventory, trunk inventory is determined by item size and not item weight. An item size is a hidden attribute, but generally speaking, ammo is considered zero, most miscellaneous items are zero or one, weapons start at one and can go up to six, and armor starts at 7 and can go up to 15. 
The last perk that the Highwayman grants the Lone Wanderer is a 50% chance of skipping unwanted random encounters, which is a lifesaver around the San Francisco area where you are just constantly running into high-level enemies. Given that the Highwayman is the only drivable vehicle that obviously works and is in use in the game, there are some unique and rather humorous things that can happen. The first time, the Chosen One drives to the settlement called Broken Hills, which is a mining town that is mostly inhabited by ghouls and super mutants. The player will load into the game from the overworld map, with a ghoul partially run over. This poor soul goes by the name Lumpy and seems to have a habit of getting run over. He claims to have been hit by a Nuka-Cola truck years ago, sending caps flying everywhere. This is a great callback to a random encounter from the first Fallout, where the Vault Dweller would find an overturned Nuka-Cola truck, and with it, a small jackpot in the form of a stash of caps. It seems like Lumpy has some bad luck around vehicles. Another event will occur should you drive to New Reno, and then enter a different part of Reno by foot. When you come back to hop into your sweet ride, you find that it is completely gone. No, this is not a bug or a glitch, and a street hustler named Jules has information on what happened. Speaking to him, he will at first deny knowing what happened to your car, but after some, uh, persuasion, he will eventually admit that he knows where it is. He directs you to a part of New Reno where the chop shop that we spoke of before can be found, and your highwayman is inside with several choppers. Chop shoppers. Shop choppers. Whatever you want to call them, they're all scumbags. You always have the time-honored option of just going full American Psycho and killing everyone, but this is Fallout 2, so you have more than one option. You can pay to get your car back for a maximum of $1,000, and going this route will give the Chosen One the option to get T-Ray's upgrade to the trunk and 50 free small energy cells. With high intelligence, charisma, and speech, the Chosen One can convince T-Ray that the car is actually the crime boss Mr. Bishop's car, and T-Ray will be intimidated into returning it. He'll upgrade the trunk just for the inconvenience he has caused, and he'll also give the player 50 energy cells, and he'll even do this every two weeks. Alternatively, if the chosen one is a female, they can, quote, engage in personal liaison to recover the vehicle. And lastly is probably the most difficult option, which is to sneak into the car and drive away. The Highwayman is not only seen or referenced in Fallout 2, however, as one, maybe THE one, can be seen in Fallout New Vegas. The map marker labels the location as Wrecked Highwayman, and indeed, the top and the rear of the vehicle can be seen poking out of the ground. This inclusion was actually planned for the cancelled Van Buren, where a Wrecked Highwayman was supposed to be included with a trunk full of microfusion cells and a tanker fob which was a quest item in Fallout 2 that was needed to get the tanker to take the Chosen One to the Enclave oil platform. The wrecked Highwayman in Fallout New Vegas has microfusion cells, energy cells, and a Sunset Sarsaparilla star cap. And upon encountering the wrecked vehicle, the Fallout 2 ambient track called Gold Slouch will start playing. That is a great touch. Chris Avalone, a game designer that worked on Fallout 2 and New Vegas, said that the rear of the Highwaymen was the only part shown as a nod to a fairly common bug in Fallout 2, where sometimes most of the Highwaymen sprite would go missing, except for the rear of the car. There are several other references in other games, including a tire iron in Fallout 3 named Highwayman's Friend. What appears to be the front of a Highwayman is on the cover of the astoundingly awesome Tales magazine in Fallout 4, and a Highwayman can be seen on the Fallout 25th anniversary banner. Matt Norton wrote an entry on one of the Fallout Bible sections about behind-the-scenes info on the Highwaymen. He explained that the large tanks on the back in an early version of the vehicle were to be the fusion or fission power source for the vehicle, and that they had intended the Highwaymen to be upgraded with armor and weapons and play a much bigger role in the game. In the end, the demands were just too great, and the trunk that would have housed the power source just became a lousy old normal trunk. Chris Avalone also spoke to the fact that the Highwayman appears to be the only functional car in the entire Mojave, but he explained that that was a game design decision more than anything. More cars do exist, hence the presence of the Chop Shop and Smitty's Garage. 
but they chose not to include more working cars since stealing another working car would be a lot easier than getting the highwaymen working and could cheapen that quest or cause people to just never get the highwaymen working. I for one hope we get more love for this car as the series goes on, since as the slogan goes, nothing stops a highwayman. Lumpy learned that the hard way. Let's continue to cover all the Christless cars that we see in the series with this smoke show, known as the Cherry Bomb. The Cherry Bomb is a one-seater because two seats would hinder its primary purpose, speed. First introduced in Fallout 4 and appearing in Fallout 76, the Cherry Bomb can be seen in a promotional poster with the tagline, Life is a race, win. In the bottom right in much smaller text, the poster also says, Cherry Bomb, the first car to break the sound barrier. If that's not marketing BS, then that's incredible. This would mean it can go in excess of 767 miles per hour or 1,234 kilometers per hour. So now we can start to understand why it only has one seat. The first land vehicle to break the sound barrier was the Thrust Supersonic Car, which broke the sound barrier in 1997, which is a lot later than I would have thought, and did so 50 years and a day after Chuck Yeager broke the sound barrier in the Bell X-1. Now, I think that their claim is that the Cherry Bomb was the first conventional production car to break the sound barrier and doesn't have anything to do with being the first land vehicle to do so. But we are not even close to having a relatively conventional car achieve such speeds, so we really have nothing else to compare it to. The design is obviously very retro-futuristic, with the fins, the bubble canopy, and the very distinct front lights? I'm pretty sure those are the lights. The front reminds me of a speedboat hull, and I'm pretty confident that the design takes inspiration from the 1956 Firebird 2 concept vehicle. Although the Cherry Bomb is much longer and much wider than the Firebird 2, there are some key features that the Cherry Bomb seems to have taken. The most obvious are the cone-shaped features that are seen inside of a cylindrical recess. In the case of the Firebird, these are actually turbines. You can see the turbine fans pretty clearly, and although there don't appear to be any turbine blades on the Cherry Bomb, nothing else comes as close to resembling the very strange, what I am assuming are front lights on the Cherry Bomb. The Firebird also has a bubble canopy, although it isn't a full dome, but the back of the Cherry Bomb has more cylindrical rocket-shaped features coming off the back, which the Firebird also has, although they're not as recessed like the Cherry Bomb. I am guessing that these may function in some capacity as a brake light since no other backlights can be seen except for blinkers on the side. Unless those small lights are the brake lights and these chrome features are related to exhaust or the propulsion system. The Cherry Bomb has a TV screen in place of a normal dashboard, presumably to act as an instrument panel to see your speed and other important details, and has a unique joystick configuration to drive the vehicle. The absence of any pedals or anything else leads me to believe that the joystick controlled the speed, braking, and turning all in one. One would think that such a fast car would be a rare sight. Surely this thing must have cost a chunk of change. In fact, there are a couple hundred that can be found between Fallout 4 and Fallout 76 combined, and there's even one in the otherwise fairly quaint Sanctuary Hills neighborhood in Fallout 4's pre-war section. A cool crossover with this car occurred with Forza Motorsport 6, where it was included as downloadable content. Forza had a whole snippet with a bunch of information, but the canonicity of this information from Forza is questionable since it is a game completely separate from the Fallout franchise. I think it is worth looking at a number of the more interesting claims though. The DLC pack states that the so-called Rocket 69 has 950 horsepower, uses an atomic V8 engine, and accelerates from 0 to 60 in 0.3 seconds. It then asks, afraid of civil unrest? Don't be. And then it describes how the bubble canopy is a shatterproof flex glass material, and is capable of stopping small arms fire. If the top speeds that they claim are true, then having a strong material for the canopy actually sounds like a great decision. Cars in Fallout also seem to have ridiculous 0 to 60 times. The fastest 0 to 60 time for a car in 2223 
is 1.79 seconds from the Paninfarina Batista, and the realm of sub one second times are all dedicated dragsters with massive slicks that are purpose built to go fast in a straight line for a quarter mile and nothing else. The Cherry Bomb was apparently a late addition to Fallout 4. The Art of Fallout 4 book states that near the end of production, the team wanted to throw in a sleek sports car, and this fit the bill. I also want to draw your attention to this picture, which was used to promote the release of the Fallout 4 Game of the Year edition, which prominently shows the Cherry Bomb and a somber looking Nick Valentine. This picture was definitely inspired by Blade Runner 2049. This scene in particular that prominently shows the car and the same orange brown, dusty and obscured environment. If the connection isn't clear, the Fallout 4 font has the line through it, exactly like Blade Runner or Blade Runner 2049 title font. And Blade Runner 2049 was dropping trailers a few months before the release of the Game of the Year edition. Obviously, there are very strong themes and similarities between Blade Runner's replicants and Fallout 4 synths. So I think it's funny that they just said, screw it, and based this artwork so heavily off of the movie that was set to come out not long after Fallout 4's release. Let's hop back to Fallout 3 to take a look at an unnamed car that was within the Chrysler's most famous car brands, Corvega. This one, simply referred to as the Sedan, we don't really know much about it, other than it was a four-door vehicle that has a nuclear power plant which will light on fire and detonate in an impressive explosion the size of a mini-nuke. I think it makes the most sense that the nuclear power plant creates electricity for the electrical motors like the Highwaymen, but knowing Fallout, it is within the realm of possibility that the engine works off of heat generated from a nuclear reaction generating power through a mechanical process, like some sort of piston arrangement or turbine. The car's design does not overly resemble any one car. It seems to borrow some elements from cars like the 1955 Oldsmobile 88 Delta Concept, which has a rounded hood, and vertical headlights that are set in protruding body features that run the length of the hood. There are three ways to see the sedan in its full, undestroyed splendor. One can be found inside the mothership Zeta, during the DLC of the same name, a few can be seen in the Tranquility Lane simulation parked in driveways, and a small scale model can be seen on Alistair 10 Penny's desk. The sedan design was also adapted to the bumper cars that can be seen at Point Lookout. The symbol on the front, the Chevron, looks like an exact copy of the one that can be found on a number of 1950s Chevrolet vehicles like the 57 Chevy Bel Air. This chevron seems to be the symbol for Corvega as it is seen on almost all of the Corvega vehicles. The very first car that was ever seen in the Fallout series is an unnamed Corvega Coupe that was first seen in the intro of the first Fallout. During the scene where the TV is playing flashes of pre-war American broadcasts, a short advertisement is shown where an impressive looking car with side pipes is shown. This car is described as having 800 horsepower having a 0 to 60 of 0.5 seconds, and like the Highwaymen, is completely analog with no onboard electronics, all for the sweet price of $199,999. This isn't the last we see of this specific coupe, but it is definitely the best shot we get. The design of the car is quite unique, with the cylindrical component in the middle being the most prominent feature. What this is is not known, but it was more than cosmetic since destroyed versions of the car show that there are pipes and other components that come off of it. It looks most like a turbine, but since we don't know exactly how the car operates, it is hard to say if this was part of the propulsion or some sort of intake. The closest match that I could find in this regard is the General Motors 1951 LeSabre concept, which had an oval-like feature prominently displayed on the hood, although it was only there for aesthetics. It was inspired, though, by jet engine designs that were coming into vogue around this time. The name Corvega is a combination of Corvette and Vega, two names used by Chevrolet, and a lot of the early Corvettes sported side pipes, just like the coupe that we see. The coupe can be seen in one of the ending sequences for a brief time, and otherwise is found in abundance throughout the Fallout and Fallout 2 wastelands. They are all rusted, 
busted, or otherwise inoperable, and the only use seems to be in making makeshift walls for the survivors of the war. It would be really great to see this coupe though in a newer Fallout in full 3D glory. Another Corvega coupe was first introduced in Fallout 4, but is also found in 76 and is known as the Chrysler Blitz. This is quite a common coupe in both games, and again is a nuclear powered vehicle that can get a little explodey. It is worth noting, not only for this car, but at least the entire Corvega line, that according to Dance in Fallout 4, they all have small fusion engines under the hood. That seems to definitively answer the question as to whether they are fusion or fission powered. This is another car without a direct design inspiration. In fact, the design is very unique with the forward sloped front end that would be extremely dangerous for pedestrians and dual lamp vertical lights. The closest design that I think could have served as a loose inspiration is the 1956 Oldsmobile Golden Rocket. The Oldsmobile's shape in the front is a lot more complicated, but the forward slant and the chrome features that are stacked vertically like the Blitz's headlights do share a resemblance. The side profile has a similar downswept angle as the Oldsmobile, and most notably, there are two rocket-shaped taillights that protrude dramatically from the rear, similar to the Oldsmobile. Again, I think this is only a loose resemblance, but it seems the closest of any production or concept car I could find. There isn't much else to the Blitz, other than Curie has dialogue where she will mention she has heard that it is a good economical family car, although that may no longer be the case due to the ravages of time. In Fallout 3, we get the first look at a car that can also be found in Fallout New Vegas, and in Fallout 4 and 76 with a slightly updated look. There are advertisements in Fallout 3 that say Atomic V8 in the bottom right, and it isn't entirely clear if this is the name of this model of Corvega, or if it's their way of branding the power plant, similar to modern day cars that will have advertising or badging that reflect what kind of engine they have, like Power Stroke, Hemi, etc. In any case, to make things less ambiguous, I will call this the Atomic V8, even if that is not necessarily what the model is called. The design changes a bit between Fallout 3 and Fallout 4, but I see some resemblance to one vehicle in particular. The large conical chrome features and the stacked headlight and blinker setup seem to resemble the 1953 Buick Wildcat concept more than anything else, although the Fallout version adds more chrome spikes just under the headlights. The Fallout version also obviously has a much larger grille. The Atomic V8 can be seen in some places, parked in front of a trailer, no doubt showing that some people were using it to tow their campers and other vacation toys. There are hundreds of Atomic V8s across the entirety of the games, and it's worth noting that there is a unique feature where the windshield is segmented and it appears that the middle portion with part of the roof can be removed. And this is often missing on wrecked vehicles in Fallout 4 and 76. There existed a cop version of the Atomic V8 in the Fallout 4 concept art, although one wasn't implemented in game, and the Atomic V8 features prominently on the cover of a magazine in Fallout 76 called Tales from the West Virginian Hills. Speaking of the cop car, let's just cover that real quick since it is obviously also a Corvega model that we finally see in Fallout 76. It has a single spinning light on top, along with a spotlight mounted over the driver's side front wheel and an antenna that the original car doesn't have. There is a faded star on the door, and while they can be found all over Appalachia, they have a particular presence in areas where strikes and other civil disobedience was occurring. There is an old rusted cop car in Dagger's Den, which is a heavily fortified base for the Blood Eagle Raiders, that has a harpoon gun affixed to the hood and is enough to make any Mad Max fan look at it a little closer. The last of the known Corvega cars that can be found in Fallout was introduced in Fallout 76 and is a very rare sight. Known as the flying car, this Corvega must have been absolutely cutting edge since it has no wheels and presumably hovered above the ground, although we don't know its true flight capabilities. There are only two in the whole of Fallout 76, found in Sugar Maple and the Garahan Estate, both areas owned by extremely wealthy families. 
The design is once again unique, but I see some resemblance to the Dodge Fire Arrow 4 concept, with the large grille and the pronounced bulbous structures on either side of the flying car seem like exaggerated versions of the Fire Arrow's own body features. The flying car looks much more aggressive, and I can't help but wonder if the flying car uses a variation of the grab plates that we can equip on the Highwaymen, and I assume that the hovering technology is mostly housed in the large bulges on either side of the car. Since it is a Corvega, we can assume it's nuclear powered, but they don't actually ever explode. Perhaps these high-end vehicles that were driven by the ultra-rich were made to be bulletproof. It is very interesting to note that this is a two-passenger vehicle, but the passenger sits behind the driver in a tandem seating arrangement like a pilot and a navigator. Tandem seating is very uncommon, but has been tried in unconventional car designs like the Messerschmitt KR200, which was a 1950s era microcar design that we will see again in this video. Let's take a look at a unique car that is only shown in Fallout New Vegas in one place, the so-called Vicky and Vance Death Car. Located in Prim, inside a casino that bears their name, this is one of the oldest designs that we have seen in the series, but there is a reason it is on the floor of a casino and not in a parking lot. This car was owned by a criminal duo known as Vicky and Vance, whose luck eventually ran out when they found themselves in a shootout with the cops. They were both killed in the shootout and the car bears the scars of the gunfight, with the bullet holes clearly visible. The story of Vicky and Vance and the car were inspired by the infamous Bonnie and Clyde criminal couple from the real world who also met their early death in a shootout when driving their 1934 Ford Deluxe V8, on which the death car in New Vegas is closely modeled after. Something really interesting though is that Vicky and Vance aren't Fallout's version of Bonnie and Clyde. Bonnie and Clyde existed in the Fallout world. There is even a little bit of contempt because of how well known Bonnie and Clyde are, whereas Vicky and Vance were apparently much less well known and were accused of being Bonnie and Clyde copycats. Another Fallout New Vegas special is the Highway Patrol car that can be seen all around New Vegas. There are two different kinds, one bearing the Nevada State Seal and presumably used by the Nevada police, and another with a California seal. The design resembles cars like the 1953 Mercury Monterey with the lights, rounded hood, and grille, or maybe even the 1952 Studebaker Champion. It also has a huge turbine or rocket looking component in the trunk that kind of resembles the large rounded tanks that were meant to feature on the Highwaymen in Fallout 2 and definitely have to do with the propulsion system. They can be found at police stations or the Mojave Outpost, as well as a few random places in the Mojave. Hey you, yeah you, wanna see some pixels? Of course you do, because we have a number of Fallout and Fallout 2 cars that are only ever shown as environmental set dressing that comprise the makeshift walls of settlements or are otherwise just found rusting away. This old destroyed deuce coupe design is seen in a few different angles, but it is honestly hard to say what vehicle might be the most similar. The overall design is reminiscent of many coupes made in the 1930s. If you have an idea, let me know in the comments. There is another coupe that can be found and looks most similar to some of the 1940 coupes like the Ford V8s. Again, if you have a close match, leave a comment. It is interesting to think that a majority of the junked cars in the first fallouts bear more of a resemblance to cars from the 30s and 40s, with the Highwaymen and the Corvega being notable exceptions. There's no way that they are all actually from the 30s and 40s though, right? Was there some sort of revival of this style before the 50s and 60s style cars that we see in other Fallout games? One 60s era car that does seem pretty recognizable is always only found in the makeshift walls, but it is identifiable. These wall sections seem to be made of all the same car. If you look carefully, which I've done for longer than I care to admit, all these are the same car, just in different positions in various states of disrepair. The tail lights seen on the top blue one and the headlights and grill from the one underneath, along with the side showing the rear windshield and C pillars, all point to this being modeled off the 1964 Thunderbird. Disagree? Fight me. 
Fallout 4 was the first time we see what we will call the station wagon, which also features in Fallout 76. The large and common car had a huge canopy where there is enough seating for at least six people, and interestingly, the trunk is split into two different compartments. It seems like part of the propulsion system sits right in the middle and therefore splits the trunk. The station wagon takes direct inspiration from the 1950 Studebaker Champion with the circular grille and the headlight shape, but is noticeably missing the big bumper, which sounds safe. It also has suicide doors where the hinges are on opposite sides, so the front door will swing forwards and the back door will swing back to open and this style really fell out of favor after the 1960s. Fallout 76 is the first time we see a limousine. Ooh, fancy. One would think that this would be very rare, maybe like the flying car, but there are actually 46 that can be found throughout the Appalachian wasteland, with the highest concentration of them found around Vault Tech University. The limo has three pedals and a gear shift, so we know at least this vehicle has the only proper kind of transmission, manual supremacy. The front somewhat resembles a 1950 Mercury or Buick Coupe with the rounded headlights, round hood, and prominent vertical slat grille. Like the flying car, the limo is only seen in areas where wealthy people were, and they also do not explode when shot. Even when they are in very good condition, they will not get set alight, and I think there's a good possibility that these are hardened vehicles, which were made to be less susceptible to attack. There is a group called the Free Radicals in Fallout 76, and a member of the group known as Lugnut is the local repairman and is in the process of trying to fix one of these limos. He has sent some men to go and salvage parts for the endeavor, with plans to modify the suspension and the exhaust, while putting spikes on the sides to deal with ghouls and other creatures, while mounting a harpoon gun on the roof to spear himself some settlers. A rare to find vehicle in Fallout 3 that has depressingly little to talk about is a non Corvega sedan pictured here. It is far less common than the other cars we are covering and isn't seen in later Fallouts. It was very clearly inspired by the 1955 Lincoln Indianapolis concept car with the stacked headlights and the bulbous protrusion from the front of the vehicle. Fallout 3 introduced a car that was a radical change from the massive boat-like cars that encapsulate the vibe of the 1950s and 60s. The Fusion Flea is a three-wheeled microcar that only had enough room for one person. It is accessible through a latched door, and like all the cars in Fallout 3 in New Vegas, will explode in a fat man-sized nuclear explosion. So even this tiny little vehicle was nuclear-powered. This car is definitely inspired by the Messerschmitt KR200, and that's even mentioned in the Art of Fallout 4 book. There was a slight redesign for Fallout 4 and Fallout 76, although it is a lot closer to the original design than some of the other cars that were redesigned. Apparently, some were reused to be some trolley cars as part of the Rally Rollers amusement ride in Fallout 76, which, honestly, that's not a bad use for these little guys. The Zip Car is the only other micro car in the series and was introduced in Fallout 4. While functionally it seems to be just like the Fusion Flea, it does have a drastically different design. That said, I can't help but think of the Heinkel Cabin Cruiser Type 154 because of the impressive visibility with the multitude of large windows. The Zip Car explodes like all the other cars, so nuclear power confirmed. I think it's worth pointing out that there must have been no car safety regulations whatsoever. Cars are seen without bumpers, without fenders, in wedge shapes that would cause pedestrians to go under the car instead of over it. There are no seatbelts to be seen, and best of all, these things take no time to explode once damaged. Just think of a traffic jam when one of these things goes kaboom. I think that fits right in with the Fallout world though. Regulations, precautions, and corporate oversight were essentially non-existent as long as the right people were in charge. And that was the last of the cars. But look forward to future videos where we go over trucks and vans, as well as motorcycles and other vehicles that we can find in Fallout. Thank you for making it this far, and thank you to my patrons. If you want to help me save up $199,999 for a Corvega Coupe, you can join these lovely people on Patreon or YouTube memberships. 
Adam bless you all. Take care of yourselves. And I will see you next week.